lowering payroll taxes, increasing the royalties paid to the province for natural resources, and eliminating the separate school board in order to create one giant public school system. That's just some of what Mike Schreiner has in store for the province if elected. Joining us now for more on that plan and how he hopes his party will elect its first Green MPP, here is Mike Schreiner, the leader of the Green Party of Ontario and that party's candidate in the riding of Guelph. And we welcome you back to TVO, Mr. Schreiner. It's always a pleasure to be on TVO, Steve. Thank you for saying so. Let's just share some of uh, your platform uh, mm -hmm. in more detail for people to uh, chew on and then we'll chat, shall we? Sure. Uh, coming up in the Green Party platform, lowering payroll taxes for small businesses by doubling the employer health tax exemption. That would be paid for by reversing the Liberals' so-called Bay Street corporate tax cut by 1% and setting the rate at 12.5%. There's $3 billion in annual transit funding in a green budget, which would come from congestion charges, gas taxes, and parking fees. The Greens say they would save us $1.6 billion annually by merging the public and separate school boards, basically the end of the publicly funded Catholic school system. They would cancel the refurbishment of expensive nuclear plants, purchasing low-cost water power from other jurisdictions to save a billion dollars a year and create 56,000 jobs. That's some of the Green Party platform. Let's just, uh, let's start at the end there. Why cancel the nuclear refurbishment? Well, because we can buy lower cost water power from Quebec to replace what Darlington would produce, and that saves a billion dollars a year, and we want to invest that in your home. The other parties are talking about hydro handouts and gimmicks as ways to deal with rising energy prices. That will not work. It's going to cost us money we can't afford. We found a billion dollars to invest in your home to help you save money by saving energy. That will create 56,000 jobs in construction, trades, architects, engineers, uh, people designing more uh, efficient appliances, lighting, and uh, housing materials. Presumably we lose jobs though when it comes to the nuclear rebuild, no? A few, but um, by far most studies show that you create about uh, 14 and, and times and even higher more jobs through things like energy efficient retrofits than you ever would through uh, nuclear investment. You'll, you'll forgive this question because I'm not sure if you heard about this, but there was a gas plant cancellation and it ended up costing a certain big uh, amount Absolutely. of money. How, are there contracts that you would have to cancel in order to stop that nuclear rebuild? Well, no, we're not saying to cancel the existing nuclear fleet. We're saying no new money going into nuclear. Okay, just checking. Yes. <laughs> Does nuclear energy, which of course we rely on for half of our energy mix in the province today, fit into the Green Party's plans at all? Well, we would phase nuclear out. No nuclear project in, on his, in Ontario's history has ever come in on budget or on time. As a small business owner, I would invest in a technology that can't deliver on time, on budget. Nobody will insure, and we have no idea what to do with the waste. It doesn't make economic sense when there are lower cost alternatives like water power from Quebec. And if that's going to save us a billion dollars a year, which we can invest in your home to help you save money by saving energy, to me that just makes sense. Is there any concern that you would have about relying on the province of Quebec, which at the moment is part of Canada, but mm -hmm. who knows, <laughs> uh, for our power? No, because uh, first of all, Quebec sells a lot of their surplus power to the U.S., another country. Uh, why not sell it to their neighboring province of Ontario? And we would also see it as a phased-in uh, contract. So. While we were getting water power from Quebec, we could be developing our own Ontario water power sources as well as green energy sources, and most of all, helping people save energy. Right now, people in New York State use power twice as efficiently as we do in Ontario. Let's have our homeowners and our businesses use energy as efficiently as our neighbors in New York State, which will make our businesses more competitive globally and help homeowners save money by saving energy. Okay, I asked you this at your platform kickoff, so you're going to recognize the question again, but it did intrigue me that as you went through your nine-point plan, mm -hmm. environment, a direct hit on the environment, was well down the list. <laughs> and I wondered whether the Green Party, which of course emerges from care about the environment, is somehow uh, rearranging its priorities to seem more even-handed with other issues as well. Well, obviously, the environment is a very important part of the Green Party's platform. I mean, one of the reasons we start with jobs is, is we want to end the myth that somehow there's this competition between the environment and the economy. There is not, Steve. 
Right now, the jobs of the 21st century are jobs in environmental fields, in clean technologies, uh, renewable energy, energy efficiency, electric and hybrid vehicles, investing in transit, which is going to be our transportation sources of the 21st century, investing in making your home more energy efficient. Those are all big job creators that are also good for the environment. Uh, we believe our education policies, in particular, our policies around supporting kids, uh, improving our education system, reducing childhood poverty, those are forward-looking policies that are about their future in the same way that our environmental policies are forward-looking policies, ensuring that we protect the people and places that we love, which is why we're promoting uh, protecting prime farmland and source water uh, regions. I'm the only party leader right now in Ontario who signed the Food and Water First pledge to protect prime farmland and source water. We all have to eat and drink. And uh, those, you know, those, are, those environmental policies are within our top nine priorities that Green MPPs will deliver on. Speaking of drink, would you sell the LCBO? Uh, no, we would keep the LCBO public. We would like to liberate local beer, though, and uh, make Ontario's craft breweries, give them the opportunity to sell good locally made beer in uh, their own stores. Okay, let's move on to tax policy. All of the parties have different ideas out there on how to create jobs by using the tax system. The Liberals mm -hmm. have talked about a $2.5 billion fund to subsidize the creation right. of jobs. The NDP is offering tax credits for people who hire people. The Progressive Conservatives are offering uh, corporate tax cuts down to 8%, I think, mm -hmm. which they think would stimulate job creation. You're offering a payroll tax cut. Explain how that would work. Well, first of all, in the last recession, small businesses were the only sector of the economy to create jobs, and the Green Party is the only party standing up for small businesses. You know, the finance minister talked a lot about small businesses in his budget speech, but really didn't deliver anything concretely. We believe by uh, lowering payroll taxes on small businesses, by doubling the employer health tax exemption for companies with payrolls under $5 million is a way to spur job creation because we're basically taking taxes off jobs to help small businesses create those jobs. Uh, and we would pay for that because we're being very honest with people and very straight with people about how we would pay for everything because we do need to be conscious of not increasing the budget deficit. We would increase Bay Street corporate taxes by 1%. Uh, if if the liberal and conservative uh, corporate tax cuts would work, we wouldn't have a job crisis in Ontario. And so we think let's, let's not go with those failed policies of corporate tax cuts which haven't worked. Let's try something different, which is supporting our small businesses to create good local jobs and make our local economies more resilient. I need to ask you about education policy because you are mm -hmm. the one person who is daring to stick their hand into the blender that is mm -hmm. politics, religion and education. We have seen in the past that when politicians try to do that, that hand gets smacked down pretty quickly. Why do you want to make a single unified school system? Well, we think it's an issue of fairness human rights and fiscal responsibility. I mean, is it fair to Jewish parents that we don't have a Jewish funded system, uh, but we have a Catholic funded system? Uh, is it right that um, we allow a publicly funded institution to violate human rights uh, codes in terms of hiring based on religion or sexual orientation? And in particular, in this day and age where our schools are so under-resourced, why are we leaving $1.6 billion on the table that could be invested in our kids' classrooms? I think the education minister should be ashamed of the fact that half the principals in Ontario are sending children with special needs home from schools because we don't have the resources to support them. The fact that the government is closing down rural schools and a number of neighborhood schools. Um, the fact that teachers are being attacked. I mean, Bill 115 took their bargaining rights away. And all of that is because of lack of resources in our schools. Well, if we merge the best of the Catholic and public system, we could save up to $1.6 billion that we're currently spending on duplicate administration, busing and buildings, and invest that in our kids' classrooms so we can provide a better education for students who are in the Catholic system right now and who are in the public system right now so we can support teachers in the Catholic and the public system so children with special needs can get the services in our schools that they need and so that kids can attend a neighborhood school rather than being bused across town. We think ending segregation in education is a win-win for everyone. How would you tell the 30% of Ontarians, I think, who are Catholic, who have enjoyed this privilege for almost 150 years now, that you're going to take it away? Well, you know what? I think in the 21st century, uh, a lot of the concerns that legitimately led to the creation of separate schools 
you know, 150 years ago, which may have made sense at that time, just don't make sense anymore today. And what I would, when I'm telling Catholic parents and Catholic students is, we want more money in your kid's classroom, not on administration, busing, and buildings. The way to do that is to merge the school boards and take that $1.6 billion, put it into your children's classroom, and in classrooms that include all students from all walks of life and all religions. You ran pretty hard on that, actually, in 2007. It was, mm -hmm. a higher part, it was a higher profile part of your platform. And you got 8% of the votes, which is an all-time high in the province of mm -hmm. Ontario for the Greens. Then in 2011, in the last provincial election, it was in the platform, but you didn't run all that hard on it. And you went back down to 3%. What lesson did you take from that? Well, I think one of the biggest lessons I took is that the Green Party really makes our decisions based on um, good public policy. I mean, I've been telling everyone we're all about bringing honesty, integrity, and good public policy to Queen's Park. And one of the things that really hit home for me is why we need to push our school board policy harder and stronger was a report that came out in 2012, in the spring after the 2011 election, which was the most definitive, comprehensive, independent report on how much money we could save by merging the school boards. And when I realized that we could save up to $1.6 billion that we could invest in our kids' classrooms, we said, you know what, we have the evidence now. Let's go out and let's really present this to the people of Ontario because I know people want us to invest in our kids' classrooms. You're running in Guelph. Yes. The Minister of Education's riding. That's right. Is Guelph. <laughs> are you having any all-candidates debates with her? We are. The first one is tomorrow morning. I mean, it's interesting. I, I selected Guelph because I started my first uh, local food business in Guelph uh, 18 years ago. And uh, so Guelph's a, and I've started a couple other businesses in Guelph. So Guelph's a community, just from working there for many years, I know is a, is a very green community. It's probably the greenest city in all of Ontario. Um, and then it turned out after we had said I, you know, I was nominated, was running in Guelph, it turned out that uh, Ms. Sandals was appointed Minister of Education. And I think this is a great opportunity for us to have a real debate about the future of education in this province. Well, you said that magic word, and I want to follow up on that. Debate. You're yes. not in the leaders' debate again. Um, did they give you an explanation as to why you're not in? I have no idea. And I think that from a democratic standpoint, that's wrong. We've been advocating for democratic debates. Uh, and the biggest thing is we just need rules and rules that are transparent. If everyone knows what the rules are, then we know what thresholds are needed for participation in the leaders' debate. But this, this sort of behind closed door discussion, there is no transparency about what the rules are. I don't think that's fair to the people of Ontario. And I don't think that's fair to political parties like the Green Party that are shut out of um, debates that should be democratic. Just to clarify, you are running candidates in all 107 ridings? We are, yes. Uh, has anybody ever said to you, Mike, win a seat and you can, and you can play? You don't win a seat, you don't get to play. Some people have suggested that, but nobody has said these are the rules. If that was the rules, fine. At least we know transparently what the rules are. Right now we don't, and I don't think that's fair to the people of Ontario, and I don't think it's very democratic. I wonder how big a deal it really is, because I do remember in 2008, Elizabeth May, your federal leader, yes. did participate in the leaders' debate. Do you remember how many seats she won after that debate? <laughs> None. None. And right. she didn't have a seat either. She, di she didn't have a seat, and she didn't win any seats. Uh, it was after 2011, that's right. ironically a debate yes. she did not participate in, that she won her first seat. Maybe it's overrated participating in these things? <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, the, on the other hand, in last year's BC election, where Jane Sturck, the leader of the Br Green Party of British Columbia, participated in the leaders' debate, there were no Greens in the BC legislature. Uh, and after that election, Andrew Weaver was elected as the first Green MLA in, B in BC. So I think it does matter. And I think more than anything else, I mean, the Green Party really is putting forward a platform that's about honesty, integrity, good public policy, prioritizing jobs, kids, and the environment. And I think people want to hear that, and particularly on the environment. I mean, none of the other three parties are talking about environmental issues. I mean, I don't think I've heard one of them mention climate change. And I'm thinking, you know, after, you know, all the wacky weather we've been having lately, you know, it's like droughts one year, extreme floods the next year, major ice storms the following winter, that we would want to be having a conversation about these important issues, especially something like climate change, where if we don't address it, we're going to go broke. But let me follow up on, on that in this regard. You know at Queen's Park, in our first-past-the-post system, if you are a, an officially constituted party, which whatever that is nowadays, is it eight seats? You've got to win at least eight seats, I think, something like mm -hmm. that. That's when you get ice time and question period. That's right. when you get budget money, uh, you get uh, resources right. in order to do research and so on and so forth. Can one 
lonely green MPP at Queen's Park really make any difference at all? Absolutely. I mean, Elizabeth May is already shown as one green MP in Ottawa. What a huge difference she's made. I mean, she was elected hardest working MP, parliamentarian of the year. Um, she's raising issues that the other parties don't talk about, that Canadians want our political leaders to talk about. I will do the same thing at Queen's Park. I will bring change to Queen's Park. I will fight the status quo. People tell me every day, Steve, that they're sick of the political status quo. They're sick of the games and the gimmicks, the magic math. Some journalists are calling it fairy tale politics in this election campaign. I want to cut through all that with honesty, integrity, and good public policy. And I believe one Green MPP can make a difference. There's a lot of cynicism out there. I don't have to tell you, Mr. Schreiner. And oh. for those who say, yeah, you say that now because you've never been in, the minute you're in, you'll be as bad as the rest of them. How do you counter that? Well, first of all, read our platform. I mean, one of the biggest compliments I've received around our platform is, is that it's a no BS zone. People are telling me, it's like, whoa, I don't know if I've ever seen a political platform that is just so straightforward, so clear, and so honest about what we want to achieve and how we want to pay for it. And, you know, if we're doing that now while we're trying to get elected, we're certainly going to continue to do that once we are elected and have seats at Queen's Park. How many do you think you can win? I think we can win one or two. Uh, I'm pulling very strong in Guelph. We're, that's a very winnable riding for the Green Party. We have an amazing team on the ground. We're pulling very strong in Dufferin Caledon, where the mega quarry was a huge issue and where the whole Food and Water First campaign, which I've signed on to, is a big issue there, protecting prime farmland and source water regions. We're also pulling very well in Perry Sound, Muskoka. I think people there realize that a healthy environment is essential to a healthy economy. And also just downtown Toronto and Trinity Spadina, where our position about being honest about how we're going to pay for transit is resonating with voters. Was it in, I'm trying to remember now, 2007 you came second in one riding? We did, yes. Maybe Bruce third Gray and a few town. more? That's right, a number of them. Okay. I, I do hear this Including a lot. Including Guelph. <laughs> Including Guelph. Every time you're on this program, it's funny, you know, if I'm walking down the street or on the subway or whatever, people do come up to me and they say, you know, I saw that Mike Schreiner guy on your show last night. He did, did a good job. They say, but I'm worried about voting for him because I'm worried it's a wasted vote. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and if he can't, if he really can't win, well, then I really got to be more strategic in how I vote. Maybe they don't use those words, but you know, that right. kind of thought. Mm -hmm. How do you convince somebody a vote for the Greens isn't a wasted vote? I tell you what, if you are sick of politics as usual, you're sick of the status quo, the gimmicks, the scandals, the boondoggles, there is an alternative, and that is the Green Party. And if you don't vote for the future that you want, we'll never have that future. And so I'm telling people, don't for, vote for what you're afraid of. Vote for the future you want for your children. I have two young daughters. I'm worried about their future. That's why I got into politics. Vote for the future you want. The election is taking place, of course, on the 12th of June. For many students, the year is already over. Yes. Post-secondary students, That's I'm right. thinking. Which, you know, I don't think it's so outrageous <laughs> to say the younger generation is perhaps more attuned mm -hmm. to environmental issues yes. uh, than mine or other generations. Is that a problem for you in terms of pulling the vote? I mean, it does create some challenges for us because certainly young voters are more likely to vote green. But uh, we're getting a lot of young voters out, um, or just volunteers actually, out knocking on doors, putting up signs, helping us out. A number of young uh, voters, particularly in Guelph, are very enthused about voting for the Green Party because they recognize the fact that we're talking about issues about how to address youth unemployment, how to uh, build the infrastructure for their future, how to create the jobs of the 21st century, and that really excites young voters. Can I ask a nasty question to conclude with here? Always. <laughs> You've been the Green Party leader for how long? Uh, since November of 2009. If you don't win a seat this time, is that it for you? You know what, I'm focused on June 12th right now, Steve, and after that date, I will, you know, we'll talk to our members and decide what the future will hold. But right now, my only focus is on June 12th and getting our message out that we can restore honesty, integrity, and good policy to Queen's Park. As I say to all the leaders when they come through here, good luck out there on the hustings, Mike Thank Schreiner. You. And thanks for visiting us at TVO tonight. Always a pleasure. That's the leader of the Green Party of Ontario, Mike Schreiner, who's running for his party in the riding of Guelph. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.